Hi, it's Wendy Olson here. It's time for week nine lecture. This is the introductory part, and there's three parts to the lecture. So I'll get a start on having the slides showing. I'll just bring those up here. Welcome to everybody. This is your introduction to comparative research. So I'm very happy to be here today and be able to share with you some of the aspects of comparative research that I've applied in my own studies in South Asia. And we're going to have some examples today, some buzz questions. It's not just going to be lecture, but of course, you have to be with others in order to discuss these concepts, to use them. So I will focus on the more challenging concepts and a bit less on the easy things. So the coverage in the lecture is an introduction and then looking at different kinds of comparative research. And then lastly, looking at some examples of comparative research. So one of the classics is a book by Barrington Moore. And this book is dated now, really. I wouldn't adhere to any of what I'm gonna say at this time, but let's look at what was said in those days. Um, it was an ambitious book and it looked at how democracy arose in some countries and how it didn't arise in some other countries or it was challenged or it was destroyed, had periods of falling into disarray. And the book uses examples like England and Germany. So it follows in a, in a tradition that was set up by Marx. Karl Marx wrote about um, capitalism in England compared with Russia and a number of other countries and Lenin did the same. So it's sort of in this tradition of big studies of different countries. And, and so if we read the example of the German path to democracy, it was described as a path to fascism, but that reflects the decade in which the book was written. 1960s was well after World War II and still in a period when an author might generalize about Germany from outside of Germany. Whilst actually, if you lived in either part of Germany, at that time, there would be East Germany and West Germany, then you'd have completely different views and you wouldn't agree with uh, this theory by Barrington Moore. But it has been a really famous book. It was published in USA. And it, you can see that it's theorizing things from a political economy approach. So that's sort of a traditional terrain of some of the comparative research. Of course, there's also educational research and psychological research and economic research, all on a comparative basis, they become very ambitious studies. So we wanted to show you how you could do such an ambitious study. And it is challenging. So the definition of it in this dictionary that I've referred to on the slide is that the, the comparative research actually tries to isolate factors or variables that explain patterns. So the variables would represent those factors. And most commonly, the comparative research is cross-national research. And so it would be systematic. That's what this author has said, WP Vogt. So he, he says in order for it to be systematic, it would have to be experimental, for example, with control groups and experimental groups. But actually, that isn't always the way that comparative research is done. It depends on what the background and purposes of the researcher are. So particularly in medical research, we would want control groups and experimental groups. But if we were in nursing, which is very close to biological research, but not the same as biological medical research, in nursing, you might want mixed methods and not to have control groups. Um, the reasons for that are complex. I've explained them in my book on mixed methods. Uh, it has to do with the fact that you would want to have interaction with subgroups. And you wouldn't want to assume that all the nurses that you're studying are going to be acting in the same way. And so it's a question of what can be assumed at the beginning of research. And that requires knowing what is the topic of the research. So what we're finding is that for vote, it's very simple. You do comparative research with experiments. But for many other people, including Barrington Moore, including me, you might have prior theories that would enable you to make a decision about methods so that you could do comparative research with different methods, almost any method. And so it's open to many different subject areas, disciplines, and so on. And for me, one of the things this shows is that even a dictionary can be wrong in a way. It can be too narrow in the way that it's defining something because it has a particular audience in mind. But if we think of a different audience, like the politics of resistance or the politics of rioting or the, the theories of war, then we might not want to use experimental research. You can imagine you cannot do experiments on situations like a war situation. So um, 
everything in research methods is a bit contested, really. So let's just think then, which of the following books or methods interest you and why? And what I'm going to do is just let you break into breakout groups for a minute when we have the discussion period. And we're going to look at this link. So first I'll pull up the link with my handy computer. It may be that we have to do that during our discussion period. The SAGE um, comparative methods map has a whole bunch of links to different types of comparative research. And there are so many in that list, it's just amazing. And I wanted to know which of those methods would interest you. And, and then the question is then, would your interest in a method depend on what your topic was? Would your topic already be a given when you decide on how interested you are in the method? So can we do that exercise when we're together and we'll have breakout groups and we can discuss that. In that list of methods, these are some of the methods that were listed as comparative research methods. Um, there were many country comparisons. You could have quantitative methods or survey methods used for those. You could have the single country case study. You could use case oriented methods. And in your reading list, there are works on the case based research tradition, which is a comparative tradition. But it's not always multi country. Sometimes it's different cases within the country. So you must try and think of different ways to have cases within countries which are not cross country comparative, for example, court cases or patients in hospitals, or you could have the cases of students in schools. That's what's meant by case oriented research. And so in the end, all these different research methods fall into different groups and categories. And according to one author, you have positivism or post-positivism. According to other authors, it's not that simple to divide things into those two groups. So we'll talk about that a little before moving on to the examples of cross-country comparative research, just to illustrate comparative research. In comparative research design, at the very most basic, the design would consist of having two cases and use more or less identical forms of data collection. And so you would hope to get the same kinds of data about both cases and do the same kind of analysis. So you're sort of holding constant or neutral the role of the observer and holding constant or neutral the differentiation in how the data is collected. And then, so we could look at say all the six countries of the Middle East and if there was a country that wasn't collecting data on a consistent basis, we might have to leave it out because in the interests of scientific values, we'd want the data to be comparable. But if it's not comparable, and, and if the seventh country has the data collected on a different basis, then it has to be left out. And that might happen with a country like Palestine, if it's left out, then other researchers might think, well, that seems fairly incomplete. And so there's a question really whether it's possible to do comparative research. And what I've observed in my career is that it's very ambitious to do this. And sometimes it's really challenging. And in a case like Palestine or now Afghanistan, where there is a war or civil war or boundary doubts about parts of the space that's called a country, then you do get difficulties in data collection and you may just have missing data. And so it's not quite clear what to do when the data is missing for one part of a geographic region. And it's not really right just to leave it out, but it perhaps needs some discussion. So the strength of comparative research when it's possible is, rest, is, is that you can understand the social phenomena of one place as they contrast to another place as a contrasting case. So you might compare you know, German people in Germany against German speaking people in Switzerland. And that's a really interesting comparison because the regulations are different in Switzerland, but they're nearby. Or you might compare French people in Switzerland and in France, or you might compare all three, Switzerland, France and Germany. And so you can get cases of people in their language groups nested in their countries. And that kind of nesting also comes into comparative research. So we'll go into it more, but first I'm going to present one of the older and very traditional background studies that was done that was a comparative research project. And it looked at six labor markets. It's called the Skelly study, social change and economic life. And in the Skelly study, they had chosen these regions 
to be contrasting and not to exhaust the whole of the British geography. So each one was actually bounded by usually a river or a sea and was, you could say kind of a river valley. Like one is a coal mining and manufacturing center in Scotland, Kirkcaldy. Another one, Rochdale here in Greater Manchester. Aberdeen in Northeast Scotland is a city. So they weren't inclusively covering all the regions of Great Britain. They were just choosing six labor markets. And by doing that, they produced a lot of research outputs comparing high unemployment areas with low unemployment areas in that time in the late 1980s. And they used quantitative questionnaire surveys com combined with follow-up interviews of a third of the respondents. So a very interesting study. And some of the people that worked on that study had excellent careers following. Here's the PhD thesis that came out of the study. So a big comparative study is done by a team. It's not done in your master's dissertation. Um, and here's a PhD thesis, which compared those six areas. You can see them listed here in the first table, Aberdeen, Coventry, Kirkcaldy, Northampton, Rochdale, Swindon. And you get some idea that chi-squared tests can be used to make comparisons of how variables are associated in these different areas and across these different areas. So you have the idea of within and across or between the areas. But what you don't see here is any other countries. So is it ethnocentric? Ethnocentric means centered upon a single ethnicity or a single group. And here the group is Great Britain and the PhD covered Great Britain not the whole of the UK. I hope you know the difference that has to do with the inclusion of Northern Ireland or its exclusion. And then it, this question of whether something is ethnocentric keeps rising its head. It will keep coming up. So we're gonna to return to that question in a bit. We just wanted to illustrate this particular comparative research because it compared those six areas. Now, another um, comparative research project was published by Peter Johan Moore and you can look that up. It's on international comparison of librarianship and looking at comparative librarianship. So a very interesting research. And you can look a lot of things up and see how they did their research. That's the methods side of the question. So here in, in Lohr's research, he says, we have no formal variables or hypothesis in mind when we start. We select two or three countries, such as Egypt, France, and Colombia, study the available literature on the public libraries, et cetera, et cetera. So can you see that this particular man is not using the survey method? He's not using a quantitative method. If he does use quantitative method, it will be the exploratory forms of quantitative method. He may choose to use mixed methods or qualitative methods. And I'm just gonna show you a little bit more from his research because it was um, compiling tabular forms of <clears throat> data collection. And there you see the survey method being introduced after he's gathered some data. So the data collection was responding to what they found <clears throat> and then it becomes a bigger project and it's no longer just one person's project. And you see variables and cases in the rows, observations, um, in this case of different libraries and so what was being compared then wasn't countries, it was libraries, and especially free and unfree uh, public libraries. So that's, that's another example of cross-country comparative research from a more exploratory point of view. And I just wanted to raise the question about qualitative and quantitative methods, because in the literature on comparative research, it's often said that there's a schism between the quantitative approaches and the qualitative approaches. And I want to approach that very directly today and make you think about it. It seems to me that there isn't really a schism, but you can choose to have a schism, a separation of two groups. But if one group of researchers is interpretivist and the other group is not and doesn't accept interpretivism, then you can get this separation of groups. And what happened in the 90s and in the 2010s was survey data was associated with the refusal to interpret. And instead there was that focus on falsifying theories, which meant that it, they said, or we said any objective observer would probably come to the same results, which makes the results more reliable and hence valid in that way that's sort of not only internal to one person or one project, but internal to the scientific community. And that's not the same as external validity, but it's a really valuable form of validity. And it isn't the same as how an interpretivist would establish validity. It has some 
similarities, but it's quite different. So the schism idea is that you had two epistemologies, one for quantitative methods with falsification and one for interpretivist methods, which actually work on more of a verificationist approach or, or a theorizing approach that they theorize from what they learn and observe. And the theory is consistent with what they have observed because the theory represents what they have learned. So that's phenomenological. And I know I've spoken about this before, but the schism arose very strongly in comparative research. So looking at this table, for example, it, it's offering quantitative methods in a column and qualitative methods in a column. And they're you know, quite separate, but it's in the context of that comparative research by Peter Lohr that he said these methods are quite different. Right, So he said that there is a schism, and I don't agree with that approach. Bryman doesn't agree. Blakey doesn't agree. Um, we're concerned about the schism, and I think now it's out of date, so maybe you could think it through. Let's look at the columns, and then in the discussion time, I want you to think about whether these methods in the first column are opposed to the methods in the second column in comparative context. So, for example, positivism, is it opposed to interpretivism? That's the main assertion of the table. Let's look at the detail. So is reality singular and stable? Or is it multifarious and culturally determined and socially constructed? But it, it can't really be both. This, this is the view that's being put. It has, you have to choose. Either it is one or the other. Um, is the observer external or is the observer internal? You know, that's a really important thing to think about and perhaps a choice to make during the research. So if you're going to just do survey research, then you are going to be external. If you're just going to use secondary data, then you are going to be external. But if you're going to use secondary qualitative data, you would be external, but at the same time, interpret data from within the linguistic group of the data which you are studying, because you must understand its language. So in Comparative research, we translate the linguistic materials, and then I try to interpret them from the language group of the researcher, or I learn another language. And uh, in my research, for example, I learned a language from South India, Telugu language. So I'm not sure that row three is completely antithetical. It might be that they overlap because secondary data doesn't just mean quantitative data. It also means qualitative data. And so I want you to continue through this list and think for yourself, is there a schism or not? If there is a schism, do you agree to continue promoting that schism or would you like to overcome it? Because in comparative research, there's a lot of people now using mixed methods and they're saying there is no schism or if there is a schism, it's problematic and we need to overcome that. So that's an exercise to pursue later. The, the answer I would give is that we can use integrated mixed methods it's common now in comparative research. Integrated mixed methods is consistent with pluralism and particularly methodological pluralism, where you combine the methods from those two columns. You don't use all the methods at the same time, but you can combine them. And that's not easy then to reconcile with methodological individualism. So you could be thinking about atomism versus holism and how to bring in a bit of holism into your research. So shall I illustrate that I'll use those terms later in these lectures, um, particularly in parts two and three of this lecture, I'll apply the concept of holism and the concept of atomism, because you can have a bit of both. Really. So in Linda Hamtrace's book, she defines comparative research as follows. She says you're comparing things systematically. So looking at societies, countries, perhaps cultures or systems, institutions, um, to compare systematically the manifestations of phenomena in more than one temporal or spatial sociocultural location. And I have an image for you to try and illustrate this, that it isn't just geography, it's also about different social groups. So you might want to sample from different social groups within one geography, rather than sampling from different geographies. Um, the diagram appears a little bit later, so I'll, I'll return to that idea. But the hand traces book is really good and really useful, and it, it explains that some of the researchers have tried to be quasi experimental. Quasi experimental means that we conduct the quantitative methods of comparison, or we allow for control groups and contrasting groups, and we, we could actually use the qualitative comparative method, QCA, 
quantitative comparative analysis, but you would be having some control group, you know, for each comparison and for each contrast. There would be a distinct group that had the other characteristics and really explicit about that. So it, she said it was the equivalent. Uh, sorry, Lyle said it was the equivalent of a controlled experiment in the natural sciences. But I'm not sure that it can be like an experiment because we can't reproduce history, right? We can only observe. So we say that observation in comparative research is very different from experiments in other parts of the social sciences. And that's why we might try and develop a quasi-experimental approach. And that has a number of methodological implications if you want to do that. So on other points from hand trace, she says it's often multidisciplinary. Um, if it tends to be complicated, then why do it? Well, it's because it's not ethnocentric. And ethnocentrism was a pitfall, a mistake in some of the earlier work. And I've tried to illustrate that. And especially if you wanted to try and generalize your findings to other countries and cultures. I want to take an example there. Suppose we were looking at women's empowerment. Would we include or exclude Afghanistan? Well, if we decide to include it, then we have to have research evidence about Afghanistan. But if we were to exclude it and say, well, it's easier to just do the research for the, all the neighboring countries and leave that one out, uh, then we might be really missing something because there might be something really important to learn from the Afghanistan experiment. So the argument here is that comparative research overcomes the simplistic nature of some of the other research that's been done. So it usually does come sort of mid-career or in late career if you're trying to start a project. But for those who are joining in research teams, they may join at a junior stage and become part of a big comparative study. There are lots of examples of those. And some of them not only become multidisciplinary, but actually interdisciplinary or transdisciplinary. So I just wanted to distinguish transdisciplinary. There's a sort of illustration here that it isn't just applying different disciplines to the research. So say it could be politics and history, or it could be economics and sociology, but also integrating them. So if you do integrate them, of course, that's an achievement at a theoretical level. And it can involve making distinctions between different types or situations and saying, you know, this has been happening in these situations and something else happened in a different type of situation. So transdisciplinarity is really an achievement. And we don't usually even try to claim that. We're quite satisfied if we can even get multidisciplinary. And one of the reasons for that is that multidisciplinary could be achieved with two disciplines. So I've mentioned pairs of disciplines. But if you try to add three or four, if you had history, politics, and education, or if you try to add psychology to that, the project itself may fall over and fail. And that's been observed a few times now, so be careful not to try and have too many disciplines. And that's why in our MSc, really we're happy if you say I'm multidisciplinary and I'm working in two, maximum three disciplines. And you don't have to resolve some of the tensions there. So there's the reference to Hantrose's book and an example of empirical research by Maria Pampaka, who's in our Department of Social Statistics. I'm gonna talk more about that next time. So. Uh, I just wanted to finish by talking a little bit about your essays and how this relates to your essay. You actually cannot simply depend on pre-existing theories entirely. So you may need to suggest mixed methods to gather data to support you in re-theorizing something. And this is, this is going to happen probably in the middle of your research or in the middle of your review of literature. If you find that you're not satisfied with some theory that exists, so for instance, um, there's a theory called women in development that's about pr pr promoting the progress of women. And it talks about all women as if they can all be progressed from being um, uneducated and not in a job to having education and eventually getting jobs. And it, it's sort of linear. And that is not a good theory because that's not really how it works or even how people want it to work. So some women want to have a family and they want the education and family, some want family and jobs, some want job and no family, because they may want to not get married, not have children. So the diversity of humanity isn't reflected well in that theory. It's called women in development theory. So people had to create an alternative theory, and they created a theory about gender and development. And so that's what I mean, that you may be part of this effort to create new theories and not ignore the old theories. And that happens a lot in comparative research because the within country research may be inadequate in some way. 
and usually it's inadequate to the multi-country situation. So it's really tricky to develop your research design. And when you develop your research design, you also have to give a rationale for which countries you've chosen or which cases you've chosen and what kind of comparable information you might find. Now, if you want secondary qualitative information, guess where you could go to get it? You could look at Wikipedia or you could look at the CIA reports on these countries. You know, you can find texts that you can use as secondary qualitative data, which are in the public arena. So even when your MSc doesn't involve primary research, you can still use a mixture of secondary quantitative evidence and secondary qualitative evidence. And so things are getting very complex now, and you simply have to choose something that's manageable in your project, or if you're planning a project, and then you think about what are the entities in that scenario? What exists? What's happening? Um, what do I want to talk about? And then I would have what are my theories and what are my hypotheses? Um, so we'll try and illustrate that with examples in the rest of the lecture. Okay. Well, thanks for listening. This was the introduction in part one of the lecture for week nine. I'll stop here and we'll have some of that buzz discussion and then we'll carry on with part two. Bye-bye.